Okay, we are now live. So we'll just wait until two o'clock and then maybe a few minutes after that to go to one set up. Uh, just a quick note that all of this will be recorded and placed on our Twitch and YouTube channel, just for the rest of you to be aware. Thank you everyone that's currently watching our webinar. We will begin in just a few moments as we wait for more people to just stop by. Okay, so let's get started. You need a full minute. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us in our webinar today. We hope you find our webinar to be informative and a valuable resource for you and your students. So feel free to type any questions you have into the chat. We'll be answering all questions at the end during our Q&A session. We have been experiencing quite a bit of technical issues, so hopefully we can get through this. Uh, with that being said, let's get started. Welcome to Integrating Data Science into Humanities with BIT Project. So just a general rundown for today. We're gonna start with a quick introduction to BIT Project and BIT University. Then guest speakers, director Eric Van Dusen and developer Ksenia Usovic from UC Berkeley will go over the importance of data science and student team. Then we'll have a bit project curriculum showcase. Then we'll end it with Professor Jimmy Lewis from Cal State uh, University Fullerton discussing her experience working with bit project and our data science curriculum. So, but first of all, uh, who is bit project and what exactly do we do? So for this portion, I'll be going over the gist of BIT project and BIT University. 
So hello, my name is Min Tien Wen, and I'm the project manager for the university. I am currently a second year at UC Davis studying applied math and computer science. So who exactly is the project? We are a student-run nonprofit organization that works to democratize technical education. Students from all over the country work together to make technical education more accessible for all by developing open source, aka free, material that anyone is able to utilize for their own benefit. These materials include, but are not limited to, webinars, boot camps, curriculum, and blogs. We've partnered with companies such as Microsoft, Twitter, Postman, and more to develop and deliver such resources. Uh, we believe that everyone should have access to quality resources, opportunities, and networks regardless of their background. All students deserve to have equal access to technical resources that will prepare them for their future careers. So these are just some of our recent projects that we have done or are currently working on. So one of them is Hacktoberfest. So during the month of October, students were encouraged to contribute to coding projects all over GitHub, no matter their skill level. And then we recently hosted a game of thought where we had daily webinars for the first two weeks to teach participants all about the basics of game development. Even if, sorry, even if participants never developed a game before, the game of thought was designed to specifically help them get started. And at the end of this uh, game of thought, they were able to create their own game from the skills they gained from the previous uh, lectures and learning. Bitcamp is a series of boot camps where participants learn software engineering and computer science fundamentals. So the image on the right is actually one of our participants for the Microsoft Azure function Bitcamp. The high school student, his name is Bo, developed his very own heart monitor utilizing the skills and tools he learned from that Bitcamp. And then we have Bit University, which we'll get into more detail in a little bit. So we are constantly working on new projects that are geared towards helping students learn more about the tech world beyond a standard classroom setting. So well, so now, what is Bit University? Bit University is our initiative to integrate technical skills into non-technical fields, to expand the opportunities and learning experiences for students. This idea was first thought of because we noticed that companies and research institutions were concerned about the lack of technical skills in applicants for research positions. But these positions were in fields that were not traditionally technical. So we decided to form Bit University to provide students from non-technical backgrounds a solid foundation in data science. So our current mission is to integrate data science into humanities classrooms. To do so, we partner with professors and students to utilize the data science curriculum that we develop and cater to fit the classroom and the current learning environment. So these are some of our current projects for uh, the university. We are currently partnering with Cal State Fullerton and Professor Jamila Moore Pelu to teach digital history um, to I'm uh, sorry to teach her digital history students data science from a data driven point of view. And just last week, we actually officially integrated our first week of our curriculum into Professor Nin's classroom, uh, Sac State, for her sociology students. And we are looking to uh, work with Howard University in the upcoming semesters to also implement this into their classroom. So to read more about us or to learn more about our projects, feel free to check out our website at bitproject.org. So now we'll be moving on to our next section of the webinar where we will be discussing the importance of data science and the benefits of working with student teams. And to speak about this is Director Eric Van Dusen of the Berkeley Data Science Department. Take it away. Hi there. Yeah, my name's Eric Van Dusen. I'm the Interim Director of the Data Science Education Program. Uh, my email's on here, ericvd at berkeley.edu. If you're interested, definitely reach out and get in touch. Um, and I want to talk about uh, one of the main programs that I'm involved with, that's student-built modules um, for curricular innovation. What are these modules? Well, the Data Science Education Program has a vision to create opportunities for students across the university to experience data science not just students in CS and stats, but it's students in all sorts of classes and all sorts of majors. So we work with student teams and work with faculty in all sorts of classes to make new, innovative, exciting curriculum uh, in these data science modules. We 
We call them Jupiter models. It's learning based on Jupiter notebooks. And we have a really great library. The best ways to find out about these efforts is to go to this library at github.com slash DS hyphen modules, where you can find all sorts of different examples of how this uh, open source curriculum is being built. And just like Bit Project, UC Berkeley makes these available to everybody to remix for their classes, uh, to use the code, to use the data set, to use the notebooks. Um, the vision is getting students in all sorts of classes to work hands on with a data set that's relevant to their course. And so we've done this for biology, for environmental economics, for political science, cognitive science, history. There's even one for a French class. So uh, students are working uh, to build these materials and then they're put in this sort of public library and the next professor, the next professor can not only browse the, the library and see what materials are there, uh, but also can adapt them for their, for their class. So UC Berkeley has been working on data science for about the last five years in an intensive way. And there's been a massive growth of curriculum since 2015. One of which is through a really popular class, Data 8, which teaches about 3,000 students per year introduction to data science. But fundamental to that is the huge involvement of students that help with the tutoring, with the lab sections, with giving that hands-on help that helps the new user get to know data science. It's a brand new major, it's only a couple years old and there's already 900 students in the major. And throughout the data science education program, there are a variety of student teams. Right now there's about 100 students working across 10 different student teams, uh, helping bring all these possibilities to this new major. Uh, one of which is in data science connector courses. These are two unit seminars for people who are in data eight to learn about the applications of data science out in one of the domain fields. The graphic on the right, you can see there's one for legal studies, there's for psychology, there's for business studies, uh, geography. So over 35 different connector courses have been made and students help build this curriculum for these courses and help the professors that teach the courses facilitate the labs. There's very hands-on lab explorations is at the core here. Another thing that we talk about uh, is modules. And so modules are, it's not a whole class, we're just plugging something in. We're plugging in a few notebooks here and there in an interactive way into an existing class. But what I wanna say is throughout all the different efforts that we do, we have Berkeley student teams helping to build the curriculum, helping to engineer software, helping to advise other students and helping to run a research discovery program where students get research internships. So what's it like working with student teams? This is a lot of what I do at Berkeley is facilitate interactions with professors and set up these meetings. Uh, the professor can bring an existing assignment. A lot of times professors would have an assignment based on searching data from a web page or manipulating something on a spreadsheet. Sometimes also this professor will just have an idea and get the students to go out and find a new data set that's applicable. The students are in teams. They go out and work on building the notebooks. They come back with the professor. They help review, revise them, make sure that the content is taught in the way that works with the class. And then the professor might schedule help for the classroom deployment. Students might come into class and have some time in front of the whole lecture where they say, this is what it's like to work in a Jupyter notebook. Let's all open up the notebook together or after the assignment has been released, the students might help to man a chat room or a piazza board or in person, a drop in where they help students get through uh, their interactive notebooks. So why is this a great experience for students? The students that work on these teams get really awesome project management experience. A lot of the students get to work one-on-one -on -one with a professor, which at UC Berkeley can be kind of rare that students might be one-on-one -on -one with a professor. Uh, they also get to improve their data science skills. So taking uh, a new data set, working it into shape, working it into uh, the shape that other people could do exercises on it uh, are all a bunch of great data science skills to work on. The students can also build out their domain knowledge. If they're working on that French class or that history class, they're going 
them to learn so much from that field that they're helping the professor. So it's really helpful. And our vision of data science education is definitely like it's an interdisciplinary thing. You need to have that domain knowledge to be a good data scientist as well. A lot of students get involved because they're interested in peer education. And when I see the BIT project people, I see that they're pretty committed to peer education and that's a fulfilling reason to be involved uh, overall. The students are also getting a bunch of experience with programming. And if you see this little graphic at the bottom with the little green dots, that's what it looks like when you go on GitHub and you have a really active commit history. This is a lot more active than mine, but students who work consistently over time can get a lot of this rich experience and that can really help them when going for data science or programming jobs. What's the professor experience? So a lot of what my pitch to professors is, you're getting some interactive, exciting curriculum. And the idea of Jupyter modules that we build is we can build these for people who don't know how to code at all and who might be intimidated. So you get some active project-based learning. Uh, and in this online world, we're challenged to make um, you know, active and project-based learning exist in the, in the cyber way. Um, the professor can learn some up-to-date approaches, and I'm constantly challenged to learn more by working in these Jupyter Notebooks and bring my skills up to the way data science is being uh, used today because, you know, the platforms that I learned statistics on back in the day are not the platforms that are being used today. The students in the classroom can have rich peer-to-peer -peer interaction, so students teaching other students is definitely like a great practice in my classroom. And we sort of believe that data literacy, these skills around data, exposure to data, comfort around data are needed in every field. Whatever fields this students might be graduating in, it's gonna help them to have some comfort with data. There's also a way that these can be used to have students who are maybe afraid of coding, maybe afraid of data, maybe afraid of quantitative approaches, if we make it, um, sort of pre-built enough for them, they can have a great experience for data and get over some of those fears. Uh, this notebook on the right is for a large, uh, you know, several hundred person biology 1B class, and they're interacting with the data through sliders. They don't need to run code, but they can rerun a predator-prey simulation by changing the parameters of the code and see the data set get generated and graphed so they can learn by simulating over and over and changing the simulation. If you are interested, we have a lot of open source materials. We have a lot of open source materials about how to teach, how to teach data science, how the infrastructure works, if you go to data.berkeley.edu slash external, we've built a whole page for other professors to learn about the way that Berkeley is doing this with a suite of open source tools. And we hold an annual workshop in June. Uh, if you go and to the external website, you can find a lot of resources, how-to guides and videos from our last year's workshop in June. And if you're interested to learn more, um, come to our uh, online workshop in uh, June 2021, uh, where when it's online, it can be open to everyone. Um, so we would love to meet you. We would love to interact you, with you. We would love to hear about what applications you're thinking are, of doing. And we'd love to share materials if they might be relevant to your field. Thank you. On to Ksenia. Not quite. Sorry about that. So now to offer a different perspective of developing data science material and working on student team modules uh, is module developer Ksenia Usovic. Hello, guys. Um, I'm sorry for that background. <laughs> I'm joining you from the comfort of my car because of power outages. Go 2020. Um, okay, so my name is Tanya Usovic. I am a, a senior um, at UC Berkeley. Uh, I used to be a modules developer. 
Um, at the moment, I'm a global adoption team lead and I work alongside Eric. Um, I use this as, a, as both a modules developer and a connector assistant, both of those programs that Eric mentioned previously. Uh, I myself am a transfer student and I came in as a linguistic major, linguistics major and I was initially interested in cognitive science, uh, but I was so intimidated by the computational component of it that I was like, maybe it's not for me. Luckily, I got enrolled in Data 8, Foundations of Data Science class, um, and changed my mind. <laughs> so now I'm majoring in Data Science and Cognitive Science, and we can go to the next slide. Um, so modules development. Um, you've learned already a lot, of, uh, a lot about this program. So um, modules are those short introductions into DS that can be incorporated into like various fields, various classes. We've done them for sociology, biology, econometrics, business administration, you name it. We probably have done, uh, have developed modules for that. Um, they're done in Jupyter Notebooks. Why Jupyter Notebooks specifically? Um, because they're beginner friendly. They have this beginner friendly programming environment where you can have your input, your output, your textual information all on the same page um, together with all of your visualizations. So you can keep it all in one place. It's really um it really is less intimidating a less intimidating environment for the beginners than an id would be um and um all the textual and visual encoding information can be on the same uh, in the same notebook which is super convenient because when you give prompts to your students um they can go ahead and code right in the cell below it super convenient um why I joined the modules development team after data eight, I wanted to continue to do more coding, but not specifically take uh, any upper division CS classes. So um, I joined the team to to learn a little bit about um, building uh, Jupyter notebooks and um, learn coding hands on. Um, and I wanted to help others get the introduction into the field of uh, data science, um, because I thought that creating modules will benefit um, both me and those students who will be taking classes where they learn some Python and some data science. We can go to the next slide. Thank you, sorry. Um, so we as the modules developers um, create those programs, create Jupyter notebooks. Uh, based on students' needs, based on professors' needs, because uh, the professor would know what kind of majors come into his class. Um, it can be more computational, less computational. Um, I developed classes, uh, I developed modules for both classes where the professor didn't know, didn't need for students to learn any Python programming, but wanted for them to become more comfortable to build this data literacy that Eric mentioned before, um, to learn how to, he wanted for them to uh, learn how to analyze graphs, how to understand their data, how to interpret the, uh, their data. Um, but I also developed for the classes where professors specifically wanted for their students to learn some Python so they can use it for their final project in the class. Um, as Eric mentioned before, developers can also assist at the lab. Um, again, I developed for the classes where we've assisted with um, actively assisted at the lab so we can troubleshoot any pro problems. Uh, we also developed for the classes where TAs, for example, didn't know how to code. Um, and we actually um, ran those notebooks with them before we launched it to students. We gave it to students and we assisted the labs as well. Um, so far, I've developed modules for three classes, business administration, city planning, sociology, and most of the students were not from, not, uh, from computational majors, not from CS or DS majors especially in sociology. I don't think anybody, as far as I know, uh, nobody was um, taking any data science or computer science classes before coming into the, that class specifically. In city planning, it was um, a more of a mixed crowd. Some people actually knew how to code before coming into the class, but we still developed an intro to Python module um, on the first lab. So students can learn all the necessary Python skills python tools um, to use in, in the later notebooks and later for their project final project and go to the next slide so this is just a few examples of the notebooks um, you can you have a lot quite a lot of freedom as to how you 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 want to you can build your notebook um, 
as long as you just follow the recommendations of the professor and keep the needs of students in mind. For city planning specifically, I actually used a lot of Hamiltonian. I literally gave all of the examples, all of the coding examples um, with different lyrics, different dates, different names from Hamilton the musical uh, to make it more fun for students to learn it uh, because Hamilton was such a hit um, and to make to make it more fun for me while developing it. Can go to the next slide. While learning, yes. So I know that some people are intimidated about the any computational uh, fields like DS or CS, and I was I, I myself was like that. Um, I think regardless of whether you go into um, whether you actually. Um, become a data scientist or not, you still will use um, some analytical skills. You will still need to use some analytical skills in your future research and work, um, even in sociology and um, other humanities majors. Um, it kind of opens a wider range of job opportunities for students, um, just stating that they they know the some programming environments and they know how to code in python even if the, if the knowledge is super basic um and yeah as i said no matter the field there is always a data analytics component involved if if students are going um to further their education to go into um graduate school they still will be learning um some computational knowledge taking some computational classes to analyze their data for their research Who can learn this? Absolutely anyone. I'm the living proof of that. Um, so for our module specifically, we often use Python, which has like a very English-like syntax and great online community. So if students want to continue their education without taking class at their college, at their university, they can still do it by themselves uh, at their own pace, at their own time. Um, it's quite easy to learn um, as a language and um, even complete beginners will not struggle with it as much as with some um, low level languages like C or Java, where there is a lot of um, non-English like syntax. Um, so many beginner friendly projects and classes are available online for those people who want to further their education. And um, to be a data analyst, um, a student does not have to like have to deep, deep dive into math and CS. Um, they can just learn the basics and start using it immediately and then further their education if they want to and if have the need to, to do that. Thank you so much, guys, for um, your time today. I'm sorry that I'm joining from this environment. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll post my email in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ksenia, for speaking about your experience and offering such encouragement to begin working with it. So we'll now be moving on to Bent University's uh, curriculum showcase, which we, will be done by our student developer, Abdul Ajira. Uh, Abdul, you're muted. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Atul, I'm a senior at UC Davis and one of the members of the Bay University team where we are currently working with a, on a digital history course with Dr. Moore Pugh at CSU Fulgen. So I wanted to give you a, a, a quick rundown of what we've been doing there and how it's been going. So um, just to give you a quick recap of what Bay University is and what our goals are. So our primary directive is to help students from traditionally non-technical backgrounds develop a strong foundation in data science and specifically in the case of a digital history course like the type we've uh, built over at CSU Fulton is to provide those students the technical knowledge and skills that's necessary to use these data science tools and answer sophisticated, more sophisticated questions in ways that they couldn't have previously as well as to generate meaningful insight from historical data. As far as actual platforms and that we're using to disseminate curriculum, we're mainly using Jupyter Notebooks. And the reason, and as for why, is 
for some of the reasons that Ksenia mentioned is that they're super convenient in that they allow you to combine um, written content, code, and just multi any type of multimedia into one compact, easy to share document. And beyond that, it's very tactile. It's very interactive because if you're a student who is who's been given these lecture notes via Jupyter Notebooks, you can not only just look at the code, you can run it, you can uh, play around with it, you can modify it to see what it does. And having that level of engagement with the um, topics at hand really develops a deeper understanding uh, from the get-go. And we, we use Google Colab to host these notebooks because it's a, a website is directly on the browser and there's nothing to download. So it's, it's very quick and it's easy to pick up. And finally, um, our other main tool in curriculum in, is by using Piazza, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's an online discussion forum that allows students to post questions um, yeah, and get answers not only just from the instructors, but also from other students. And this is a really great way because not only does it allow, you know, uh, allow us to build a huge data bank of questions and, and knowledge, but also it allows students to ask questions asynchronously in other words, they don't have to wait until the next lecture or until office hours to ask questions. They can ask questions on Piazza as soon as they come up and then receive an answer in minutes sometimes, which is really cool. So I wanted to give you a quick preview as to three of the notebooks that we're, we're using in the digital history course, specifically the first three weeks. So in week one, we go uh, right into um, looking at Python and teaching the basics. And it really is the basics, just the essentials that uh, they need to write code for the rest of the semester. And as you can see here, this is what a, a no Jupyter Notebook kind of looks like. And here we have code blocks that can be run like this, and then they can actually be ran, and you can see the output right here. So it's very interactive, which is really cool. On week two, we actually, uh, go right into integrating more historical context by actually analyzing a, his, a historical data set. Specifically, we decided to analyze the data set about the sinking of the Titanic and about the crew members and survivors. So, for example, one of, the, one of the applications we teach students how to do is, let's say that you want to figure out what was the average survival rate by age group. In other words, did younger people survive on average, uh, were more likely to survive the sinking of the Titanic than older people? that may seem like a relatively um, easy question to answer, but just in case, you can you can actually prove it and and do it using this library called Pandas, which is a, an open source data science library in Python that allows you to do very quick and efficient data analysis. And as you can see here, we can answer a question like that in about four lines, whereas if you actually had this data on paper and try to do it by hand, it's a much more involved process. And the, in week three, we move on to talking about visualization, where we show students how to actually you know, take data and use this library called matplotlib to generate this very pretty and very um, nice looking plots and graphs. For example, like you know, line charts, bar, bar charts, and scatter plots. And this is where we really show students how, uh, how you can visualize data to um, see trends and patterns that you couldn't have previously just by looking at the numbers. And the overall idea is that within the first three weeks alone, students have all the technical knowledge, knowledge and expertise that they need to do some very, very basic exploratory data analysis on a, on a data set, uh, no matter how big it is, and, and generate a report on it, which is uh, what one of the very first practicums or labs are um, in the digital history course. So yeah, um, our curriculum that, we, that we're using is also open source. You can take a look at it here at github.com slash bitprg slash bitu three week bootcamp. And uh, feel free to take a look at it, um, you know, uh, review it. Uh, if you have any suggestions, we, uh, we'll be very happy to take a look at them and, and see, take any opportunity to improve the curriculum. And with that being said, I'm, I'm gonna currently hand it off to uh, Dr. Moore Pugh so that she can give you more details about what we've been doing at the digital history course and that the course structure and philosophy. Thanks, Atul. Um, thanks, I'm happy to be here. My name is Jamila Moore Pugh and I'm an assistant professor of history with a focus on digital humanities and history and new media at Cal State Fullerton. Um, so as 
we um, discussed, I'm, I'm just gonna expand upon some things that I told mentioned about the course. I'm gonna just share some quick background on our DH initiatives at CSUF. I'm gonna discuss a little bit more about the course structure. And then I'm gonna share how this curriculum in particular um, that we're developing with Bit University um, centers first generation and minority students within a field, um, or at least two fields that um, they are less represented in, um, both in data science and in um, digital humanities. And then I'm gonna, uh, with that tool, uh, share some highlights from our collaboration. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with digital humanities, um, a quick and uh, kind of account of it is that it's uh, the use of digital technologies and new media to respond to and investigate humanities questions. Um, so it takes on many different subfields, but if you'd like to learn more about it, I have a video here that is available in which I describe it more in more detail. Um, over the course of the past, um, I would say five years um, in being at CSUF, we have um, evolved the digital humanities curriculum, um, beginning with two courses offered in 2016 um, and a digital uh, humanities colloquium series. We uh, launched the Mapping Arts OC project that was work done by students working with uh, community members to digitally map uh, public art in the cities of Santa Ana and Long Beach, California. Um, and then by 2019, our first four MA students graduated with completely digital MA projects. So this year with support from um, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, we were able to launch this course, which is integrating data science into um, our a regular uh, introduction to digital history course 403A. So this course is really um, set up to shape students' um, understanding of how data science and data analytics is becoming a pertinent part of the historical discipline. And so we wanted to really gear this towards developing new skills in a methodology that they might develop or come across later in their careers. Um, so a, a little excerpt to give you an idea of what the kind of foundational questions are for this course is how does data analysis reshape and inform historical practice and what unique contributions do historians as humanists who are particularly rooted in questions of why and how bring to the field of data science. So how do we do this? Well, we focus on three things in particular in this course, exploratory learning and discovery, collaboration, and developing new skills over mastery. And in some cases, these have become kind of mantras that we have to say almost you know, once a week, because I think for many students, particularly um, this being an upper division history course, they come in already having mastered the discipline um, and expecting to apply those same skills towards data science and digital humanities. And that is kind of the opposite of where we want them to go. We want them to focus on developing skills and engaging curiosities and, and becoming more exploratory learners. Um, and so this gives you a brief snapshot of some of the learning objectives that range from things that we've heard mentioned before, um, developing um, you know, digital literacy skills, um, you know, developing basic uh, programming skills, working with a couple um, libraries in um, uh, Python libraries. And really the key one here that I've learned is the last one, which is reflecting upon their learning process. So the course is structured to meet twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. On Tuesdays, we hold a seminar style discussion where we read material, look at project sites, and have um, and student-led discussion. And then on Thursdays, we meet with the BIT University team, and we move our discussions into hands-on applied learning within Python using the notebooks that they've developed. Um, the course is punctuated by three uh, practicums that are designed to instill different skills. The first one is an investigation practicum that utilizes the uh, transatlantic slave trade data set um, that's available through the Slave Voyages um, project site. And this was important to use because 
The slave trade database represents a pivotal moment in quantitative history, but also in quantitative history shift to data analytics um, and data visualization through the Slave Voyages Project. Um, we teach and instill collaboration and move uh, history students from the idea of the lone researcher working in the archives or their, their own silos to the team-based learning that's more familiar in programming um, and digital humanities through the collaboration practicum. We also use another historic data set called Freedom on the Move, which has um, a trove of over 27,000 runaway slave ads. And then we um, finally let students choose their own data storytelling project in the innovation practicum, where they develop their methodology based on everything we've taught them um, through that, throughout the semester. So thinking and doing in practice, I wanna give you a couple examples of how we merge the two. So this is an example on a Tuesday where we um, introduced the Freedom on the Move project site and the data sets they're in. And students um, read, we read a couple articles about data structures and data frames. And then we also read articles about the fugitive slave landscape and how runaway slave ads function as tools of policing, trafficking, and surveillance in, in the 18th and 19th centuries. We then on Thursday had students take this, choose two ads and analyze them, pulling out from them what they saw as unique data points. And then together, working with the BIT University team, we plotted them out, created lists, dictionaries, and eventually a data frame. Um, and so that was a great uh, opportunity to merge uh, thinking and doing. Another example is um, we were beginning to understand data visualization using Matplotlib. And so on Tuesday, we read um, Du Bois's um, a book on Du Bois's data portraits, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, in which he sent them in 1900 to Paris to help, vi um, to help people visualize Black America. And then on Thursday, uh, we learned about Matplotlib and how to actually do our own data visualizations. Um, students also um, expanded to do their own kind of um, project-based learning. So we had students create their own mini surveys and then develop a data frame um, from their own survey data and um, as an added kind of component to their learning. So a key part of this curriculum is centering first-generation and minority students. And I wanted to just share a few examples of how we do that because CSUF um, enrolls about 30% uh, first generation students and about 43% of um, students enrolled come from underrepresented minority groups. Those numbers tend to be a little bit higher in the College of Humanities and Social Sciences where history lives. So how do we create a curriculum that focuses and centers them as opposed to kind of just um, so, you know, sidelines them. And so one of the key things was develop, focusing on humanistic data analysis that includes culturally relevant pedagogy. So as you saw from some of the examples, that means selecting data sets and course materials that reflect diversity, both within digital studies, but also within the broader fields of, you know, data science and digital humanities. Um, another issue that we saw was the need to emphasize collaboration and peer learning. Um, it is essential, I think, for doing any kind of high impact, um, you know, type of teaching that students learn to see one another as, um, as teachers. So I told mentioned using Piazza, but we also saw the need to basically begin um, paired programming models earlier than we had planned. We plan to introduce those with the collaboration practicum, but as we saw that students, particularly in this remote learning environment that we are in due to COVID-19, they weren't connecting enough. They were struggling in the same areas, but they weren't feeling comfortable to express that in the larger group. So we initiated paired programming earlier on to facilitate more peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, we also gave students surveys um, throughout the course, and we saw that, again, students were afraid to ask questions in large group discussions for fear of not seeming smart enough, um, being judged. 
And so to encourage clear and open communication, we actually took a radical approach and redesigned office hours so that instead of students coming to times that fit our schedules with the BIT University team, um, we ended up revising and working around student schedules and having each student have a designated um, 45 minute to one hour time during the week where they could meet with a BIP University developer and go through any questions that they had. Other communication strategies were building in time for discussion in each tutorial using Piazza and utilizing the Zoom chat as a back channel, whereby one developer would be going through the tutorial and another and myself would be checking in with students in the chat and expanding upon uh, questions that they may have had. We also noticed the students struggled to begin the process of writing and finding an approach to specific coding problems. And so we implemented a walkthrough coding session um, that was that's been you know, led by the BIT University developers where they give many walkthroughs and explain why they took certain approaches to the data sets so that students get an almost behind the scenes look as well, as opposed to just getting um, the notebooks and the data and working through them. And this has really been helpful. Um, and also we, we, we had to really retrain students to think differently about their learning. And this was probably the hugest um, hurdle, but also opportunity that this curriculum posed was that students didn't see themselves as, you know, um, mathematically inclined, technically inclined, and they said as much. Um, but what we wanted them to do throughout this course is to not only think about what they were learning, but to think about how they learned um, and think about how they could modify their learning style so that they could invite new skills and opportunities into um, their, you know, their toolkit. So um, how do we do this? We had them reflect a lot on their learning and the course structure. Um, they have pre and post learning self-assessments, midpoint reflections on the course structure, the learning objectives, and we helped address their coding concerns um, in the middle of the course. Um, and then also um, through the course blog, we do a lot of reflective writing and commenting to one another. So now Atul and I are gonna uh, come together and share some highlights um, that we uh, both gleaned from our collaboration. Um, I'll let you begin. Okay, yeah, well, uh the one that I'm probably the most proud of is the fact that we were able to develop such an adaptable curriculum in, in the sense that, you know, I know from personal experience that sometimes the ways that certain programming or even some data science courses, the way they're structured is that uh, they have a very rigid uh, schedule. And if you're someone who, who, who's lagging behind, there's very few opportunities for you to catch up if you're already taking advantage of everything they're offering already. But in our case, we really wanted to make sure that you know we adapted and responded to student concerns so that whenever it definitely seemed that a large number of people were uh, having similar issues or struggling with certain, certain uh, topics or materials, we really slowed things down, rate things in, and just really uh, just W reviewed everything that we needed to and just maybe do some walkthrough coding sessions or just some examples so that everybody could um, have their uh, have their doubts cleared and have uh, just better confidence in the material. And the second thing is, in the process of that, we ended up creating a curriculum with multiple learning styles, which is really cool in the sense that uh, if you're a more of a visual person, uh, we have, you know, the actual uh, videos. If, if you're someone who likes to read, we have actual notebooks. If you're some, someone who prefers, who learns by doing, the, the notebooks are interactive, like we mentioned, so that you can actually work with them to change things up and, and see how, how it actually ticks. So, uh, which is, all that is really cool because once again, sometimes program, programming courses can be very one dimensional as far as their teaching. Uh, and that at best makes things very boring and at worst makes things kind of very detrimental to learning. So having both of those things were uh, definitely one of, the, one of the, uh, the best parts of working on this project. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and I would also say that, you know, 
Um, part of that adaptable curriculum goes into the, the idea of continuous integration and how um, by, you know, administering certain surveys or questions, or even we one day just had a debrief with students where we checked in and went around and had everyone just say where they were at, allowed us to implement continuous integration into uh, curriculum development, which is new for me. Um, usually the way I improve a course is I teach it and then after the course I weigh what did and didn't work. But by that time, that group of students that was in that course are gone and it benefits the next group of students. In this case, by using the principles of continuous integration, we were able to adapt the course as it's being taught and to really, again, as Atul mentioned, adapt, um, you know, attack the areas that students felt uh, they were they were not understanding and then redevelop the curriculum, redevelop the approach to student learning in ways that allowed students to become much more comfortable in, in the learning process. Um, so I took that away as a great highlight. Um, the other one that I found was collaborative design, just working with the Bit University team was really beneficial. Oftentimes I do not develop courses collaboratively, but I do a lot of collaborative work through digital humanities. So this was a really great opportunity to develop a course alongside a team and to glean from their expertise as well um, and to have it truly reflect the interdisciplinarity that we wanted to convey through the curriculum. Yeah, and finally, like uh, this more so of a personal highlight for me, and so that I personally thought that it was very fulfilling to be able to teach these uh, highly, highly marketable skills to, to students. Because, you know, having a data science background, a data science foundation will go a long way in making, in enriching people's careers and, and you know, uh, giving them much more enjoyable, much more uh, satisfying work. So, and beyond that, uh, the process of actually teaching these materials, I, I, I felt like it made me a better student because it helped me um, internalize these topics more and definitely um, increase my confidence as a data scientist and a data science student. Yay, thank you so much to Jyoti. Thank you for talking about your experience, Professor, and discussing the struggles and how you and Azul and the rest of the developers work together to make your students feel comfortable in this like very new learning environment for them. So now we'll be moving on to our Q&A session where we'll open up the floor to the audience to ask any questions for our speakers. So I do see a few in the chat. Um, someone did ask earlier, how do we work with grading? And how do you factor in for the teacher law, I believe? Yes. So we've integrated a grading mechanism into each and every assignment where uh, students will run all their code make sure that everything's correct and then an actual uh, an actual code snippet is present in each problem such that whenever they run the code block it automatically saves their answer into a file in a separate folder and at the very end they will actually download the, the folder and submit it for grading and we're currently in the process of making grading be as automatic as possible right now we're still have some manual grading but we're, we're making it so that uh, both uh, bit project collaborators, but also as professors and TAs don't have to spend too much time bogged down in grading individual uh, coding problems. And, and and additionally, making sure that, you know, we uphold FERPA laws and, and we prevent anybody other than the professor from having direct access to student grades and having um, access to that confidential information. Yeah, and I was just gonna add, ultimately, you know, um, um, we, we, we look at the grading um, also, but ultimately the final decision as to what gets implemented into the student's gradebook in terms of comments, final grades and feedback lies with um, me as the instructor. So, um, and ultimately what we're doing is to see how well students understood the concepts that they learn, um, but the, the, final, the final grades come down to the instructor. Okay, so we have another question. I think this is for Professor Jamila. Um, did you initially design your course to have this data science aspect implemented? 
Um, for this course, yeah. So the, the, the umbrella course, which is 403A, is an intro to digital history. And it was developed by myself and a colleague um, in 2016 to be kind of like an umbrella course for introducing students to different DH methods um, and tools. And so I taught this course very differently before. If you go to our blog on Room 528, um, it's it, you know, you can see the 2016 syllabus, but this course for this semester was intentionally designed to teach, um, to introduce humanity students to data science. Yes. Great. Um, I'm not sure if Kristen is here because she has been having some body Wi-Fi. Um, we'll wait for her to come back. I'm oh, here. Yes, Sorry, okay. I didn't realize that my camera is off. Um, so did I have any previous experience with data science or programming before I attended in Berkeley? The answer is no. <laughs> I wanted to major in cognitive science, but I was really scared of their computational component of it. Uh, we took some CS classes for that major. Um, but luckily, I explored a little bit and figured out that there is a, an introduction to data science course that was released at that time. Um, I got an email about that, I think. So I enrolled into it just to try it out. And I absolutely loved it. And I've never left the division since then. I was a modules developer and the lab assistant for that class specifically. And the class was taught in Jupyter Notebooks. So it definitely is possible, even if you have no experience with coding or statistics or anything really. Um, a good course or like those modules can, can definitely help students um, become more familiarized with um, the field of data science and become more comfortable with that, especially. Great. Okay. Um, so we do have another question. I think this is for Atul. Do you have a follow up course after data visualization with Matplotlib? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, those three notebooks that I presented, those are only the first three notebooks out of, the, uh, out of uh, three weeks. From the course that we tried at CSU Fulgen, like uh, we actually planned a full like like sixteen week course there because it, uh, for an entire semester. So those were still just the basics, uh, the, the fundamentals before we get to the advanced stuff. And but yeah, there's definitely more, and you can actually uh, find those notebooks out for yourself by going to the link that we mentioned and going to the bit the bit project repo so that you can see more uh, modules that we created after that. Okay, so there's another question about the material. So what if I want to implement this kind of material as supplementary or as extra credit for my students? Yeah, the great thing about the way we structured the curriculum is that we literally uh, designed them as modules. So each, each little week is its own self-contained unit. So they can be integrated pretty seamlessly into any curriculum you have, you know, whether it's uh, you know, near the end of a semester or quarter or anywhere in the middle, you, you can literally, we have all the materials you need as far as, you know, notebooks, um, assignments, uh, supplementary videos, uh, lecture videos, stuff like that, that all that all have been pre-built and ready so that you can uh, publish them directly through whatever learning management system you use and then have them as an extra credit module for your students. And depending on the way you want to grade them, you can make it so that uh, you know, they're graded mostly on, um, mostly on completion, or if you really want to make sure and grade them based on accuracy, all of the different tools and um, and tools that you need to make that happen are already present within the modules. Okay. To the bit project team, what advice do you have for people who have no data science background but want to get into it? What's the first step? Well, the first step is uh, like, luckily, like so far, like everything that we've been kind of talking about, not just us, but even, you know, the Berkeley team have been all about very intro to data science stuff anyway. So even if you go to the Bit Project repo and take a look at these modules, these notebooks that we mentioned, or if you go to the DS modules repo on over to the Berkeley team, all those are for people who have no coding experience or any data science experience who want to get started into it. So I definitely recommend checking out those resources and definitely just doing your own research as far as you know uh, what particular aspect of data science you want to get into because you know there's no single path. So, uh, but the repos that we've um, you know, like plugged in these uh, in this webinar so far are definitely good starting points. 
Yeah. In a few moments, I'll have all the links in the chat uh, once I like pull them up and find them. But as I get that uh, started, uh, to Ksenia, do you think your background in linguistics, linguistics, sorry, helped you in data science? Would it be relevant with NLP? Okay. <laughs> Um, I don't have a very strong background in linguistics because I changed my major pretty quickly. I did take some linguistics classes. Um, I think it will be relevant for I know for the field of natural language processing for sure. Um, but I I'm not sure how exactly it would help me in data science. To be honest, um, I can definitely see that being incorporated again, like just combined with the field of data science, but. Um, I don't think they're like they're directly related. Only like through um, natural language processing, I can probably combine them. Okay, can I just give you one moment to finish putting the link in? Okay, there you go. For the Bit project one, I gave you the general bit project repo, but let me send over the data science specific one. Okay, so I guess that's all the questions we have, and it's perfect timing. It's two fifty nine. So thank you so much to all of our speakers. Thank you for inviting us. Thank you. Sorry, so now that we reached the end of our webinar, thank you all for joining us today and for sitting through this whole webinar. And thank you for all the speakers for giving their respective presentations today, despite all the technical difficulties that we had. So all of them were very informative and insightful into developing curriculum and data science. So if you would like to stay connected with us with the project and learn more about what we're doing, um, feel free to add us on social media. And if you would like to partner with us or learn, have more information about BIT University specifically, want to set up a one-on-one -on -one with us, and or to discuss details or potentially partner with us, feel free to reach out to us through the email on the screen, info at bitproject.org. Yeah. When is the next event? There's actually an event um, there's actually an upcoming uh, bit camp. I believe it's for Intel JavaScript and partnered with um, Twilio. I believe that's how it's pronounced. I think that's happening next week. Yeah. Uh, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you so much. And I hope all of you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.